A Christmas Tree I have been looking on this evening at a merry company of children assembled round that pretty German toy, a Christmas tree. The tree was planted in the middle of a great round table and towered above their heads. It was brilliantly lighted by a multitude of little tapers and everywhere sparkled and glittered with bright objects. There were rosy-cheeked dolls hiding behind the green leaves, and there were real watches, with movable hands at least and an endless capacity of being wound up, dangling from innumerable twigs. There were French polished tables, chairs, bedsteads, wardrobes, eight-day clocks, and various other articles of domestic furniture, wonderfully made in tin at Wolverhampton. Perched among the boughs, as if in preparation for some fairy housekeeping. There were jolly, broad-faced little men, much more agreeable in appearance than many real men. And no wonder, for their heads took off and showed them to be full of sugar plums. There were fiddles and drums. There were tambourines, books, work boxes, paint boxes, sweetmeat boxes, peep show boxes, and all kinds of boxes. There were trinkets for the elder girls, far brighter than any grown up gold and jewels. There were baskets and pin cushions in all devices. There were guns, swords, and banners. There were witches standing in enchanted rings of pasteboard to tell fortunes. There were teetotums, humming tops, needle cases, pen wipers, smelling bottles, conversation cards, bouquet holders, real fruit, made artificially dazzling with gold leaf, imitation apples, pearls, and walnuts crammed with surprises. In short, as a pretty child before me, delightedly whispered to another pretty child, her bosom friend, there was everything and more. This motley collection of odd objects, clustering on the tree like magic fruit, and flashing back the bright looks directed towards it from every side, some of the diamond eyes admiring it were hardly on a level with the table, and a few were languishing in timid wonder on the bosoms of pretty mothers, aunts, and nurses made a lively realization of the fancies of childhood, and set me thinking how all the trees that grow and all the things that come into existence on the earth have their wild adornments at that well-remembered time. Being now at home again, and alone, the only person in the house awake, my thoughts are drawn back by a fascination which I do not care to resist to my own childhood. I begin to consider what do we all remember best upon the branches of the Christmas tree of our own young Christmas days, by which we climbed to real life. Straight in the middle of the room, cramped in the freedom of its growth by no encircling walls or soon-reached ceiling, a shadowy tree arises. And looking up into the dreamy brightness of its top, for I observe in this tree the singular property that it appears to grow downward towards the earth, I look into my youngest Christmas recollections. All toys at first, I find. Up yonder, among the green holly and red berries, is the tumbler with his hands in his pockets, who wouldn't lie down, but, whenever he was put upon the floor, persisted in rolling his fat body about, until he rolled himself still, and brought those lobster eyes of his to bear upon me, when I affected to laugh very much, but in my heart of hearts was extremely doubtful of him. Close beside him is that infernal snuff-box, 
out of which there sprang a demoniacal counsellor in a black gown with an obnoxious head of hair and a red cloth mouth, wide open, who was not to be endured on any terms, but could not be put away either. For he used suddenly, in a highly magnified state, to fly out of mammoth snuff-boxes in dreams, when least expected. Nor is the frog with cobbler's wax on his tail far off, for there was no knowing where he wouldn't jump, and when he flew over the candle and came upon one's hand with that spotted back, red on a green ground, he was horrible. The cardboard lady in a blue silk skirt, who was stood up against the candlestick to dance, and whom I see on the same branch, was milder and was beautiful. But I can't say as much for the larger cardboard man, who used to be hung against the wall and pulled by a string. There was a sinister expression in that nose of his, and when he got his legs round his neck, which he very often did, he was ghastly and not a creature to be alone with. When did that dreadful mask first look at me? Who put it on, and why was I so frightened that the sight of it is an error in my life? It is not a hideous visage in itself. It is even meant to be droll. Why, then, were its stolid features so intolerable? Surely not because it hid the wearer's face. An apron would have done as much, and though I should have preferred even the apron away, it would not have been absolutely insupportable, like the mask. Was it the immovability of the mask? The doll's face was immovable, but I was not afraid of her. Perhaps that fixed and set change coming over a real face— infused into my quickened heart some remote suggestion and dread of the universal change that is to come on every face and make it still. Nothing reconciled me to it. No drummers from whom proceeded a melancholy chirping on the turning of a handle, no regiment of soldiers with a mute band taken out of a box and fitted one by one upon a stiff and lazy little set of lazy tongs. No old woman, made of wires and a brown paper composition, cutting up a pie for two small children, could give me a permanent comfort for a long time. Nor was it any satisfaction to be shown the mask and see that it was made of paper, or to have it locked up and be assured that no one wore it. The mere recollection of that fixed face, the mere knowledge of its existence anywhere, was sufficient to awake me in the night all perspiration and horror with, Oh, I know it's coming! Oh, the mask! I never wondered what the dear old donkey with the panniers, there he is, was made of then. His hide was real to the touch, I recollect, and the great black horse with the round red spots all over him, the horse that I could even get upon, I never wondered what had brought him to that strange condition, or thought that such a horse was not commonly seen at Newmarket. The four horses of no color next to him that went into the wagon of Jesus and could be taken out and stabled under the piano appear to have bits of fur tippet for their tails and other bits for their manes and to stand on pegs instead of legs. But it was not so when they were brought home for a Christmas present. They were all right then. Neither was their harness unceremoniously nailed into their chests, as appears to be the case now. The tinkling works of the music cart I did find out to be made of quill, toothpicks, and wire, and I always thought that little tumbler in his shirt-sleeves, 
perpetually swarming up one side of a wooden frame and coming down head foremost on the other, rather a weak-minded person, though good-natured. But the Jacob's ladder next him, made of little squares of red wood that went flapping and clattering over one another, each developing a different picture, and the whole enlivened by small bells, was a mighty marvel and a great delight. Ah! the doll's house, of which I was not proprietor, but where I visited. I don't admire the houses of Parliament half so much as that stone-fronted mansion with real glass windows, and doorsteps, and a real balcony, greener than I ever see now, except at watering places, and even they afford but a poor imitation." and though it did open all at once, the entire house-front, which was a blow, I admit, as cancelling the fiction of a staircase, it was but to shut it up again, and I could believe. Even open, there were three distinct rooms in it, a sitting-room and bedroom, elegantly furnished and, best of all, a kitchen, with uncommonly soft fire-irons, a plentiful assortment of diminutive utensils, oh, the warming-pan, and a tin-man cook in profile who was always going to fry two fish. What barmecide justice have I done to the noble feasts, wherein the set of wooden platters figured, each with its own peculiar delicacy? as a ham or turkey glued tight on to it, and garnished with something green which I recollect as moss. Could all the temperance societies of these later days, united, give me such a tea-drinking as I have had through the means of yonder little set of blue crockery, which really would hold liquid? It ran out of the small wooden cask, I recollect, and tasted of matches, and which made tea nectar. And if the two legs of the ineffectual little sugar-tongs did tumble over one another, and want purpose like Punch's hands, what does it matter? And if I did once shriek out as a poisoned child, and strike the fashionable company with consternation, by reason of having drunk a little teaspoon, inadvertently dissolved in too hot tea, I was never the worse for it, except by a powder. Upon the next branches of the tree, lower down, hard by the green roller and miniature gardening tools, how thick the books began to hang. Thin books in themselves at first, but many of them, and with deliciously smooth covers of bright red or green. What fat black letters to begin with! Quote, A was an archer and shot at a frog. End quote. Of course he was. He was an apple pie also, and there he is. He was a good many things in his time, was A, and so were most of his friends, except X, who had so little versatility that I never knew him to get beyond Xerxes or Xantope. Like Y, who was always confined to a yacht or a yew tree, and Z, condemned for ever to be a zebra or a zany. But now the very tree itself changes and becomes a beanstalk, the marvelous beanstalk up which Jack climbed to the giant's house. And now those dreadfully interesting double-headed giants with their clubs over their shoulders begin to stride along the boughs in a perfect throng, dragging knights and ladies home for dinner by the hair of their heads. And Jack, 
how noble, with his sword of sharpness and his shoes of swiftness. Again, those old meditations come upon me as I gaze up at him, and I debate within myself whether there was more than one Jack, which I am loath to believe possible, or only one genuine, original, admirable Jack, who achieved all the recorded exploits. Good for Christmas time is the ruddy color of the cloak, in which the tree making a forest of itself for her to trip through with her basket. Little Red Riding Hood comes to me one Christmas Eve to give me information of the cruelty and treachery of that dissembling wolf who ate her grandmother without making any impression on his appetite, and then ate her after making that ferocious joke about his teeth. She was my first love. I felt that if I could have married Little Red Riding Hood, I should have known perfect bliss. But it was not to be. There was nothing for it but to look out the wolf in the Noah's Ark there, and put him late in the procession on the table as a monster who was to be degraded. Oh, the wonderful Noah's Ark! It was not found seaworthy when put in a washing tub, and the animals were crammed in at the roof and needed to have their legs well shaken down before they could be got in. Even there, and then, ten to one, but they began to tumble out the door, which was but imperfectly fastened with a wire latch. But what was that against it? Consider the noble fly, a size or two smaller than the elephant, the ladybird, the butterfly, all triumphs of art. Consider the goose, whose feet were so small and whose balance was so indifferent that he usually tumbled forward and knocked down all the animal creation. Consider Noah and his family, like idiotic tobacco stoppers, and how the leopard stuck to warm little fingers, and how the tails of the larger animals used gradually to resolve themselves into frayed bits of string. Hush. Again a forest, and somebody up in a tree. Not Robin Hood, not Valentine, not the Yellow Dwarf. I have passed him, and all Mother Bunch's wonders without mention, but an eastern king with a glittering scimitar and turban. By Allah! Two eastern kings, for I see another looking over his shoulder. Down upon the grass, at the tree's foot, lies the full length of a coal black giant, stretched asleep with his head in a lady's lap, and near them is a glass box, fastened with four locks of shining steel, in which he keeps the lady prisoner when he is awake. I see the four keys at his girdle now. The lady makes signs to the two kings in the tree, who softly descend. It is the setting in of the bright Arabian nights. Oh, now all common things become uncommon and enchanted to me. All lamps are wonderful. All rings are talismans. Common flower-pots are full of treasure, with a little earth scattered on top. Trees are for Ali Baba to hide in. Beefsteaks are to throw down into the Valley of Diamonds, that the precious stones may stick to them and be carried by the eagles to their nests, whence the traders with loud cries will scare them. Tarts are made according to the recipe of the vizier's son of Bassora, who turned pastry-cook after he was set down in his drawers at the gate of Damascus. Cobblers are all Mustafa's, 
and in the habit of sewing up people cut into four pieces to whom they are taken blindfold. Any iron ring let into stone is the entrance to a cave which only waits for the magician and the little fire and the necromancy that will make the earth shake. All the dates imported come from the same tree as that unlucky date, with whose shell the merchant knocked out the eye of the genie's invisible sun. All olives are of the stock of that fresh fruit, concerning which the commander of the faithful overheard the boy conduct the fictitious trial of the fraudulent olive merchant. All apples are akin to the apple purchased with two others from the sultan's gardener for three sequins, and which the tall black slave stole from the child. All dogs are associated with the dog. Really, a transformed man who jumped upon the baker's counter and put his paw on the piece of bad money. All rice recalls the rice which the awful lady, who was a ghoul, could only peck by grains because of her nightly feasts in the burial place. My very rocking horse, and there he is, with his nostrils turned completely inside out, indicative of blood, should have a peg in his neck, by virtue thereof to fly away with me as the wooden horse did with the prince of Persia, in the sight of all his father's court. Yes, on every object that I recognize among those upper branches of my Christmas tree, I see this very light. When I wake in bed at daybreak, on the cold, dark winter mornings, the white snow dimly beheld outside, through the frost on the window-pane. I hear Dinarzada, Sister, sister, if you are yet awake, I pray you finish the history of the young king of the Black Islands. Scheherazade replies, If my lord the sultan will suffer me to live another day, sister, I will not only finish that, but tell you a more wonderful story yet. Then the gracious sultan goes out, giving no orders for the execution, and we all three breathe again. At this height of my tree I begin to see, cowering among the leaves, it may be born of turkey, or of pudding, or mince pie, or of these many fancies, jumbled with Robinson Crusoe on his desert island, Philip Quarrel among the monkeys, Sandford and Merton with Mr. Barlow, Mother Bunch and the Mask, or it may be the result of indigestion, assisted by imagination and over-doctoring, a prodigious nightmare. It is so exceedingly indistinct that I don't know why it's frightful. But I know it is. I can only make out that it is an immense array of shapeless things, which appear to be planted in a vast exaggeration of the lazy tongs that used to bear the toy soldiers, and to be slowly coming close to my eyes and receding to an immeasurable distance. When it comes closest, it is worse. In connection with it I descry remembrances of winter nights incredibly long, of being sent early to bed as a punishment for some small offense, and waking in two hours with a sensation of having been asleep two nights of the laden hopelessness of morning ever dawning, and the oppression of a weight of remorse. And now I see a wonderful row of little lights rise smoothly out of the ground, 
before a vast green curtain. Now a bell rings, a magic bell, which still sounds in my ears unlike all other bells, and music plays amidst a buzz of voices and a fragrant smell of orange peel and oil. Anon, the magic bell commands the music to cease, and the great green curtain rolls itself up majestically, and the play begins. The devoted dog of Montargy avenges the death of his master, foully murdered in the forest of Bondy, and the humorous peasant with a red nose and a very little hat, whom I take from this hour forth to my bosom as a friend. I think he was a waiter or an hostler at a village inn, but many years have passed since he and I have met. Remarks that the sassagacity of that dog is indeed surprising. And evermore this jocular conceit will live in my remembrance, fresh and unfading, overtopping all possible jokes, unto the end of time. Or now, I learn with bitter tears how poor Jane Shore, dressed all in white, and with her brown hair hanging down, went starving through the streets. Or how George Barnwell killed the worthiest uncle that ever man had, and was afterwards so sorry for it that he ought to have been let off. Comes swift to comfort me the pantomime, stupendous phenomenon, when clowns are shot from loaded mortars into the great chandelier, bright constellation that it is, when harlequins, covered all over with scales of pure gold, twist and sparkle like amazing fish. When Pantaloon, whom I deem it no irreverence to compare in my own mind to my grandfather, puts red-hot pokers in his pocket and cries, Here's somebody coming, or taxes the clown with petty larceny by saying, Now I saw you do it when everything is capable, with the greatest of ease, of being changed into anything. And nothing is, but thinking makes it so. Now, too, I perceive my first experience of the dreary sensation, often to return in afterlife, of being unable next day to get back to the dull, settled world, of wanting to live forever in the bright atmosphere I have quitted, of doting on the little fairy, with the wand like a celestial barber's pole, and pining for a fairy immortality along with her. Ah, she comes back in many shapes, as my eye wanders down the branches of my Christmas tree, and goes as often, and has never yet stayed by me. Out of this delight springs the toy theater. Uh, there it is, with its familiar proscenium, and ladies in feathers in the boxes, and all its attendant occupation with paste and glue and gum and watercolors, and the getting up of the miller and his men, and Elizabeth, or the exile of Serbia. In spite of a few besetting accidents and failures, particularly an unreasonable disposition in the respectable Kelmar and some others, to become faint in the legs and double up at exciting points of the drama. A teeming world of fancy so suggestive and all-embracing that far below it on my Christmas tree I see dark, dirty, real theatres in the daytime, adorned with these associations as with the freshest garlands of the rarest flowers, 
and charming me yet. But hark! The weights are playing, and they break my childish sleep. What images do I associate with the Christmas music as I see them set forth on the Christmas tree? Known before all the others, keeping far apart from all the others, they gather round my little bed. An angel speaking to a group of shepherds in a field. Some travellers with eyes uplifted following a star. A baby in a manger. A child in a spacious temple talking with grave men. A solemn figure with a mild and beautiful face raising a dead girl by the hand. Again, near a city gate calling back the son of a widow on his bear to life. A crowd of people looking through the opened roof of a chamber where he sits and letting down a sick person on a bed with ropes. The same, in a tempest, walking on the water to a ship again and on a seashore, teaching a great multitude, again with a child upon his knee and other children round, again restoring sight to the blind, speech to the dumb, hearing to the deaf, health to the sick, strength to the lame, knowledge to the ignorant, again dying upon a cross, watched by armed soldiers, a thick darkness coming on, the earth beginning to shake, and only one voice heard, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Still, on the lower and maturer branches of the tree, Christmas associations cluster thick. School books shut up, Ovid and Virgil silenced. The rule of three, with its cool, impertinent inquiries long disposed of. Terence and Plautus acted no more, in an arena of huddled desks and forms, all chipped and notched and inked. Cricket bats, stumps and balls, left tire up with the smell of trodden grass and the softened noise of shouts in the evening air. The tree is still fresh, still gay. If I no more come home at Christmas time, there will be boys and girls, thank heaven, while the world lasts. And they do. Yonder they dance and play upon the branches of my tree. God bless them, merrily, and my heart dances and plays too. And I do come home at Christmas. We all do, or we all should. We all come home, or ought to come home, for a short holiday, the longer the better from the great boarding-school where we are forever working at our arithmetical slates to take and give a rest. As to going a-visiting, where can we not go, if we will? Where have we not been when we would, starting our fancy from our Christmas tree? Away into the winter prospect— there are many such upon the tree. On, by low-lying, misty grounds, through fens and fogs, up long hills, winding dark as caverns between thick plantations, almost shutting out the sparkling stars. So, out on broad heights, until we stop at last with sudden silence, at an avenue, the gate bell has a deep, half awful sound in the frosty air. The gate swings open on its hinges, and as we drive up to a great house, the glancing lights grow larger in the windows, 
and the opposing rows of trees seemed to fall solemnly back on either side, to give us place. At intervals, all day, a frightened hare has shot across this whitened turf, or the distant clatter of a herd of deer trampling the hard frost has, for the minute, crushed the silence too. Their watchful eyes beneath the fern may be shining now, if we could see them, like the icy dewdrops on the leaves, but they are still, and all is still. And so the lights grow larger, and the trees falling back before us, and closing up again behind us as if to forbid retreat, we come to the house. There is probably a smell of roasted chestnuts and other good, comfortable things all the time, for we are telling winter stories, ghost stories, or more shame for us, round the Christmas fire, and we have never stirred except to draw a little nearer to it. But no matter for that. We came to the house, and it is an old house, full of great chimneys where wood is burnt on ancient dogs upon the hearth, and grim portraits, some of them with grim legends too, lower distrustfully from the oaken panels of the walls. We are a middle-aged nobleman, and we make a generous supper with our host and hostess and their guests, it being Christmas time and the old house full of company, and then we go to bed. Our room is a very old room. It is hung with tapestry. We don't like the portrait of a cavalier in green over the fireplace. There are great black beams in the ceiling, and there is a great black bedstead, supported at the foot by two great black figures, who seem to have come off a couple of tombs in the old baronial church in the park, for our particular accommodation. But we are not a superstitious nobleman, and we don't mind. Well, we dismiss our servant, lock the door, and sit before the fire in our dressing-gown, musing about a great many things. At length we go to bed. Well, we can't sleep. We toss and tumble and can't sleep. The embers on the hearth burn fitfully and make the room look ghostly. We can't help peeping out over the counterpane at the two black figures and the cavalier. That wicked-looking cavalier in green. In the flickering light they seem to advance and retire, which, though we are not by any means a superstitious nobleman, is not agreeable. Well, we get nervous, more and more nervous, we say. This is very foolish, but we can't stand this. We'll pretend to be ill and knock up somebody. Well, we are just going to do it when the locked door opens, and there comes in a young woman, deadly pale and with long, fair hair, who glides to the fire and sits down in the chair we have left there wringing her hands. Then we notice that her clothes are wet. Our tongue cleaves to the roof of our mouth, and we can't speak. But we observe her accurately. Her clothes are wet. Her long hair is dabbled with moist mud. She is dressed in the fashion of two hundred years ago and she has at her girdle a bunch of rusty keys. Well, there she sits, and we can't even faint. We are in such a state about it. Presently she gets up and tries all the locks in the room with the rusty keys, which won't fit one of them. Then she fixes her eyes on the portrait of the cavalier in green and says in a low, terrible voice. The stags know it. 
After that, she wrings her hands again, passes the bedside, and goes out at the door. We hurry on our dressing gown, seize our pistols. We always travel with pistols, and are following when we find the door locked. We turn the key, look out into the dark gallery. No one there. We wander away and try to find our servant. Can't be done. We pace the gallery till daybreak, then return to our deserted room, fall asleep, and are awakened by our servant. Nothing ever haunts him and the shining sun. Well, we make a wretched breakfast, and all the company say we look queer. After breakfast we go over the house with our host, and then we take him to the portrait of the cavalier in green, and then it all comes out. He was false to a young housekeeper once attached to that family, and famous for her beauty, who drowned herself in a pond and whose body was discovered after a long time, because the stags refused to drink of the water. Since which... It has been whispered that she traverses the house at midnight, but goes especially to that room where the cavalier in green was wont to sleep, trying the old locks with the rusty keys. Well, we tell our host of what we have seen, and a shade comes over his features, and he begs it may be hushed up, and so it is. But it's all true. And we said so before we died. We are dead now to many responsible people. There is no end to the old houses with resounding galleries and dismal state bedchambers and haunted wings shut up for many years through which we may ramble with an agreeable creeping up our back and encounter any number of ghosts. But it is worthy of remark, perhaps, reducible to a very few general types and classes. For ghosts have little originality and walk in a beaten track. Thus it comes to pass that a certain room in a certain old hall where a certain bad lord, baronet, knight, or gentleman, shot himself, has certain planks in the floor from which the blood will not be taken out. You may scrape and scrape, as the present owner has done, or plain and plain, as his father did, or scrub and scrub, as his grandfather did, or burn and burn with strong acids, as his great-grandfather did, but— there the blood will still be, no redder and no paler, no more and no less, always just the same. Thus, in such another house there is a haunted door that never will keep open, or another door that never will keep shut, or a haunted sound of a spinning wheel, or a hammer, or a footstep, or a cry, or a sigh, or a horse's tramp, or the rattling of a chain. Or else there is a turret clock, which at the midnight hour strikes thirteen when the head of the family is going to die. Or a shadowy, immovable black carriage, which at such a time is always seen by somebody, waiting near the great gates in the stable-yard. Or thus, it came to pass how Lady Mary went to pay a visit at a large wild house in the Scottish Highlands, and, being fatigued with her long journey, retired to bed early, and innocently said next morning at the breakfast-table, "'How odd to have so late a party last night in this remote place!' and not to tell me of it before I went to bed. Then everyone asked Lady Mary what she meant. Then Lady Mary replied, Why, 
all night long the carriages were driving round and round the terrace underneath my window then the owner of the house turned pale and so did his lady and charles macdoodle of macdoodle signed to lady mary to say no more and every one was silent after breakfast charles macdoodle told lady mary that it was a tradition in the family that those rumbling carriages on the terrace betokened death and so it proved for two months afterwards the lady of the mansion died and lady mary who was a maid of honor at court often told this story to the old queen charlotte by this token that the old king always said hey hey what what ghosts ghosts no such thing no such thing and never left off saying so until he went to bed or a friend of somebody's whom most of us know when he was a young man at college had a particular friend with whom he made the compact that if it were possible for the spirit to return to this earth after its separation from the body he of the twain who first died should reappear to the other in course of time this compact was forgotten by our friend the two young men having progressed in life and taken diverging paths that were wide asunder but one night many years afterwards our friend being in the north of england and staying for the night in an inn on the yorkshire moors happened to look out of bed and there in the moonlight leaning on a bureau near the window steadfastly regarding him saw his old college friend the appearance being solemnly addressed replied in a kind of whisper but very audibly do not come near me i am dead i am here to redeem my promise i come from another world but may not disclose its secrets then the whole form becoming paler melted as it were into the moonlight and faded away or there was the daughter of the first occupier of the picturesque elizabethan house so famous in our neighborhood you have heard about her no why she went out one summer evening at twilight when she was a beautiful girl just seventeen years of age to gather flowers in the garden and presently came running terrified into the hall to her father saying oh dear father i have met myself he took her in his arms and told her it was a fancy but she said oh no i met myself in the broad walk and i was pale and gathering withered flowers and i turned my head and held them up and that night she died and a picture of her story was begun though never finished and they say it is somewhere in the house to this day with its face to the wall or the uncle of my brother's wife was riding home on horseback one mellow evening at sunset when in a green lane close to his own house he saw a man standing before him in the very centre of a narrow way why does that man in the cloak stand there he thought does he want me to ride over him but the figure never moved he felt a strange sensation at seeing it so still but slackened his trot and rode forward when he was so close to it as almost to touch it with his stirrup his horse shied and the figure glided up the bank in a curious uh, unearthly manner backward and without seeming to use its feet and was gone the uncle of my brother's wife exclaiming good heaven it's my cousin harry from bombay put spurs to his horse which was 
suddenly in a profuse sweat and wondering at such strange behavior, dashed round to the front of his house. There he saw the same figure, just passing in at the long French window of the drawing-room, opening on the ground. He threw his bridle to a servant and hastened in after it. His sister was sitting there alone. "'Alice, where's my cousin Harry?' "'Your cousin Harry, John?' "'Yes, from Bombay. I met him in the lane just now, and saw him enter here this instant.' Not a creature had been seen by any one, and in that hour and minute, as it afterwards appeared, this cousin died in India. Or it was a certain sensible old maiden lady who died at ninety-nine and retained her faculties to the last, who really did see the orphan boy, a story which has often been incorrectly told, but of which the real truth is this, because it is, in fact, a story belonging to our family, and she was a connection of our family. When she was about forty years of age, and still an uncommonly fine woman, her lover died young, which was the reason why she never married, though she had many offers. She went to stay at a place in Kent, which her brother, an Indian merchant, had newly bought, there was a story that this place had once been held in trust by the guardian of a young boy, who was himself the next heir, and who killed the young boy by harsh and cruel treatment. She knew nothing of that. It has been said that there was a cage in her bedroom in which the guardian used to put the boy. There was no such thing. There was only a closet. She went to bed— made no alarm whatever in the night, and in the morning said composedly to her maid when she came in, "'Who is the pretty forlorn-looking child who has been peeping out of that closet all night?' The maid replied by giving a loud scream and instantly decamping. She was surprised, but she was a woman of remarkable strength of mind, and she dressed herself and went downstairs and closeted herself with her brother. "'Now, Walter,' she said, "'I have been disturbed all night by a pretty forlorn-looking boy who has been constantly peeping out of that closet in my room, which I can't open. This is some trick.' "'I am afraid not, Charlotte,' said he, "'for it is the legend of the house. It is the orphan boy what did he do he opened the door softly said she and peeped out sometimes he came a step or two into the room then i called to him to encourage him and he shrunk and shuddered and crept in again and shut the door the closet has no communication charlotte said her brother, with any part of the house, and it's nailed up. This was undeniably true, and it took two carpenters a whole forenoon to get it open for examination. Then she was satisfied that she had seen the orphan boy. But the wild and terrible part of the story is that he was also seen by three of her brother's sons in succession, who all died young. On the occasion of each child being taken ill, he came home in a heat twelve hours before and said, Oh, Mama, he had been playing under a particular oak tree in a certain meadow with a strange boy, a pretty forlorn-looking boy, who was very timid and made signs. From fatal experience, the parents came to know that this was the orphan boy and that the course of that child whom he chose for his little playmate was surely ruin. Legion is the name of the German castles, where we sit up alone to wait for the spectre, where we are shown into a room made comparatively cheerful for our reception. 
where we glance round at the shadows thrown on the blank walls by the crackling fire, where we feel very lonely when the village innkeeper and his pretty daughter have retired. After laying down a fresh store of wood upon the hearth and setting forth on the small table such supper cheer as a cold roast kept on, bread, grapes, and a flask of old Rhine wine. Where the reverberating doors close on their retreat, one after another, like so many peals of sullen thunder. And where, about the small hours of the night, we come into the knowledge of diverse supernatural mysteries. Legion is the name of the haunted German students, in whose society we draw yet nearer to the fire, while the schoolboy in the corner opens his eyes wide and round, and flies off the footstool he has chosen for his seat when the door accidentally blows open. Vast is the crop of such fruit, shining on our Christmas tree, in blossom almost at the very top, ripening all down the boughs. Among the later toys and fancies hanging there, as idle often and less pure, be the images once associated with the sweet old weights, the softened music in the night ever unalterable. Encircled by the social thoughts of Christmas time, still let the benignant figure of my childhood stand unchanged. In every cheerful image and suggestion that the season brings, may the bright star that rested above the poor roof be the star of all the Christian world. A moment's pause. Oh, vanishing tree, of which the lower boughs are dark to me as yet, and let me look once more. I know there are blank spaces on thy branches, where eyes that I have loved have shone and smiled, from which they are departed. But far above I see the razor of the dead girl, and the widow's son, and God is good. If age be hiding for me in the unseen portion of thy downward growth, Oh, may I, with a gray head, turn a child's heart to that figure yet, and a child's trustfulness and confidence. Now the tree is decorated with a bright merriment and song, and dance, and cheerfulness, and they are welcome. Innocent and welcome be they ever held beneath the branches of the Christmas tree, which casts no gloomy shadow. But as it sinks into the ground, I hear a whisper going through the leaves. This, in commemoration of the law of love and kindness, mercy and compassion. This, in remembrance of me.